morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Planning Your Business's Transition. My name is Gloria Dongara, and I am with AAA, the Auto Club Group in Ponte Vedra, and I also serve as chair of the St. John's County Chamber of Commerce, the Ponte Vedra Division. Today's discussion is hosted by the Chamber's Ponte Vedra Division. Before we begin, I would like to recognize the sponsor of today's event, Fields Auto Group. Fields Auto Group has been a longtime supporter of events for the Ponte Vedra Beach Division, and we are so grateful for their sponsorship of this virtual event. Fields Auto Group is a family-owned and operated business and represents luxury auto brands. Fields' commitment to building long-term relationships has enabled them to grow to North America's premier luxury auto group. They specialize in ensuring that their customers get the right vehicle and packages, not only for their driving needs and budget, but for their lifestyle as well. I am a personal Fields customer, and I must admit, I absolutely adore my Lexus. We are very pleased that Nancy Deering Mock has agreed to discuss planning your business's transition with us today. Nancy consults with leaders to develop strategic plans implement organizational change, improve performance, and build teams. She has a reputation as an articulate and insightful speaker, sharing her extensive experience in ways that are both relatable and practical. Nancy will be sharing tips to help us successfully transition to the next phases of reopening. The extreme disruption caused by the COVID-19 crisis provides us with an opportunity to approach recovery through one of three lenses, reopening, revitalizing, or re-imaging. Many of you have already submitted some questions and feel free to submit more questions online during Nancy's discussion for the question and answer session at the end. And with that, I give you Nancy Deering. Good morning. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to share some of my thinking with you about uh, what lies ahead in terms of new beginnings for our businesses. And I actually want to thank the Chamber for inviting me to do this. And I want to thank Gloria for her leadership of the Ponte Vedra Beach Division, and also the Fields Auto Group for their sponsorship of, of this morning's conversation. I have three hats on this morning. I, I do have my consultant hat on, but I also have my HR executive hat on, as well as my entrepreneur hat, having uh, founded uh, and run three businesses of my own during my career, and I'm going to combine all of that experience into our conversation about uh, what lies ahead. I think we're all aware that what we're facing is not what the textbooks would refer to as evolutionary change, meaning incremental or gradual, um, and this may even be beyond what is sometimes characterized as revolutionary change, uh, but has actually, as the textbooks would describe it, be characterized as discontinuous change, meaning change that sort of happens out of the blue that no one was thinking about when he or she was doing their strategic planning last year. Um, and in addition to being discontinuous, it's also quite disruptive. So it's unforeseen, it's seemingly out of the blue, and as a result can be destabilizing for both people and organizations in, in which they work. So one author has referred to this as permanent whitewater, meaning that we are paddling as hard as we can to deal with and navigate through these ever-changing situations Responding to, responding to what we see as danger and trying to stay focused and getting through uh, the danger to safer or calmer waters. The impact is 
quite interesting on people and organizations and that some people fear fear they're paralyzed they're withdrawn um, but the good news is this that there are incredible advantages during this disruption and during times like this it can be a period of enormous creativity and innovation for organizations so it's a good time to sort of take a deep breath and consider what, where are we and what's really happening here. John Gardner once said that leaders of organizations can become trained prisoners of the structure. That by the time they reach the top, they can become more preservers of what is than shapers of what might be. And this might be an ideal time for leaders and managers and leaders of teams to ask, what am I doing to be a shaper of what might be? It might be a very fruitful time to ask what I call meta questions. In other words, are we gonna do exactly the same things as we did before and do them in the same way? That's doubtful. Are we gonna be doing exactly the same things, but maybe in a different or new way? That's probable. But even larger questions might be, are we gonna do the same things, but maybe have a different business model, a different pricing strategy, a different marketing strategy? And those are what I call the what if questions. Or even larger questions, could we overhaul what we do? Could we overhaul the services we provide or even the processes that we use to add value for our customers? Could we do more or different things? Another really good big question. And challenging the previously unchallenged assumptions about the things you did and how you did them. Meaning, why not? Since when? Who says? What if? Asking those bigger questions to really challenge how we did things in the past to have some real breakthrough thinking in terms of where we're headed. And this might be in doing things like virtual client meetings, it might be revamped marketing. It might be the use of e-commerce. Um, but in another really good meta question, and this is one I highly recommend, is what's called purposeful abandonment, meaning asking really, really good questions about why we do things. Purposeful abandonment actually asks the question, what should we stop doing? I guarantee you, if you ask this of your staff and your colleagues, you will get some very fruitful and insightful answers. Even questions about how you and your customers and you and your staff are even going to interact going forward. For purposes of pursuing this line of transitioning, I'm going to borrow from a book entitled Managing Transitions by William Bridges. And he divides these transitions into three phases, if you will, to be able to sort of conceptualize what's going on. Phase one, he calls ending or saying goodbye. And this is the period where we're going to observe a lot of different human responses. Some people feel grief, they feel a sense of loss, they may feel disconnected from their colleagues. Some people experience real fear and paralysis, particularly when whatever is going to be in the future is unclear. Some people get anger, uh, some people become very hostile and aggressive, and others, yet others, still withdraw. The real key for leaders, I think, during this phase one is really to harness the energy and, and the latent optimism that resides within any group 
to really tap into that energy and try to redirect any unproductive responses that you see and really direct people into using what I believe is really the enormous potential for human imagination and human creativity during this time. That moves us to what Bridges characterizes as phase two, meaning that is this is this period between letting go of what was, the past, our previous experiences, and now moving into and exploring the new reality, right? The new beginning. And Bridges characterizes this interestingly as a period of either breakdown or breakthrough. Yes, it can be extremely chaotic. It can feel very confusing. People will say things like, well, when the dust settles, and the reality is that in this situation, the dust might never fully settle. It can be a time, though, of challenging the status quo, as I mentioned before. It really can be a time of asking, what if, since when, who says, why not? What if? And it can be an enormous time of creativity and innovation. I would also suggest, from my experience and in talking to some of my clients during this period, it can be an awfully critical period for identifying perhaps previously unidentified talent within your organization or team. There may be people who have really risen to the occasion and have really demonstrated an enormous stick to or creativity or imagination or even persistence in seeking solutions to previously unidentified um, issues. And so be on the lookout during this time for talent that will rise to the surface. During this exploration phase, this is the time to think big. There are too many individuals, and I've seen this collectively in organizations as well, who fall into the trap of what I call ready, fire, aim. Uh, they thrash about sort of taking action without actually thought, thinking through um, what have we learned here? W what do we see? And what is appropriate for us to do about it? For example, how have our customers changed? How have their needs changed? How are they communicating differently? And what does that mean for us? It may require some real adaptation of products and services in order to meet those changing customer needs and expectations. How has our delivery system changed? Are we meeting less in person and more virtually? And what does that signal in terms of the building of capacity in the new realities? What are the new opportunities for new products and services? Meaning, what are people saying they need and want that no one else seems to be providing? Is there an opportunity for us to fill that void or that niche? What new relationships have formed? Now we're working with people we may not have previously worked with, and which of those actually show promise for future opportunities and partnerships going forward? So we're asking these larger questions, including what should we stop doing before launching into the new beginnings, the new re realities. And I guess, again, I will emphasize that if you ask any one of these questions to your staff, I guarantee you, you're going to have some very, very useful insights for moving forward. My recommendation during this exploration is to try and keep it as simple as possible. And to that end, I'm gonna share with you a matrix uh, that I have developed and used that keeps things what I like to call um, elegant. And it looks at simply six aspects or components of any enterprise, and then takes a look at what do we need to think about 
in preparation of our people for what we understand about the new beginnings. What is it that people are going to have to learn? How are they going to have to adapt? How do we reorganize the ways in which people work in order to meet the challenges of the new beginnings? What are we going to do about products and services? Are we going to diversify? Are we going to add new products? Are we going to change some of the products or services that we currently offer? Performance means how are we going to measure how we're doing? How do we measure our success? Is it in new clients? Is it in uh, revenue of some sort? Is it on, in, on quickness and, and how quickly we get some of the new products and services to market? And processes as well. This is an absolute ideal time to streamline your processes. I'll bet it has occurred to most of you at this point that in the past, you had a lot of processes where there were needless steps or steps that simply didn't add value and that we can eliminate those steps in the future in order to be more productive. Finances as well, this is a really good time to do a check in terms of the finances, how you're keeping track of things, how you're going to manage, especially going forward in terms of capitalization, et cetera. And the last, which is often overlooked, is communication. And that is, how are we going to stay connected to each other and to our clients and customers and to our partners during this coming new um, beginning? We have to share and interact with our staff and clients and potential clients in new and consistent ways. And I would suggest that this is a perfect time to sort of sketch in what you know about your business during this transition time. I wouldn't think much further out than 30, 60, or 90 days at this point because I really think within the next 60 days, there will be incredible learning that will impact our planning for the months beyond that. But a very simple way to do this is simply use a matrix, fill in those six components, look at the next 30 and 60 days, and then with your staff, actually start to fill in the blanks. Seek input from people, and then hold people accountable for the tasks that you, that you actually delegate to them. Put names, put dates, and then follow up. I would also tell you that part of the real usefulness of a plan like this is that it can be done and redone almost weekly. You can update it as you learn, add new tasks, remove others, and so you're really sort of as uh, one of the books that I like to refer to written by Robert Quinn is Building the Bridge as You Walk Across It. And so that's what these models allow us to do. This next recommendation I'm going to make is from a book entitled Business Model Generation. And it's one that I highly recommend even in times of less disruption than we currently face. But it too is very elegant. And you can see it has, you take a look at your business from the standpoint of your customers, your value proposition, et cetera. And it's very elegant because you can, you can actually enlist your staff in helping you fill in these blocks. And as the next slide will show, there are actually a series of questions that go within each of these components of this business model. And I've only uh, actually shown a, um, a few, but just to give you an example that you would start, for example, with your customer segments. That's why it's labeled number one. In other words, for whom are we creating value? And really, who are our most important customers in what we do? But then that's followed by the value proposition, and that is, what value do we really deliver to our customers? And are we meeting their needs? And do they have new and emerging needs that we need to be aware of? Then that goes to channels, and that is really your methods for reaching your customers. 
how are we doing that? How are we doing it now? Which ones work best? But some real opportunity for taking a look at, do we have new and additional ways of reaching our customers? The relationships is next, then followed by revenue streams, a real good time to say, have we really pushed ourselves far enough in looking for potential sources of revenue, followed then by the resources necessary to do it, the activities necessary to meet your value proposition, the partners you need to do it, and then the cost structure in terms of pricing, et cetera, that you need to pursue it. This obviously is more comprehensive, um, but a model that I highly recommend for taking a look at where are we and how do we need to think about adapting our business model going forward. I would stress again the importance of using this as the basis of conversation with either your senior staff or with your team going forward. So that takes us then to the third and final phase in this conceptual process of moving to new beginnings and some of the realities that we are all going to face. One is that things will not be like they were before. Things are going to change. We don't exactly know what that looks like, but we know it's going to be different. Uh, one of my colleagues and clients asked me the other day, now that everyone has worked from home, how do we put that genie back in the bottle? I don't think we do. I think we are going to learn from that and adapt and find new ways of working and interacting with one another. Be aware that people will still be reacting to disruption and uncertainty and may be off balance for some time. It can take up to six months after a disruption for people to feel like they have their equilibrium again. And so people are going to be reacting to this and feeling off balance for some time. Things will be etched in stone, and that is, uh, things will not be etched in stone, it should be. Do not wait until the dust settles to decide and to act. Again, do what you think sounds right at the time, and you have to be totally resilient in terms of revising your conceptions about what's going to be needed going forward. Unfortunately, things will also not be efficient because people will be revamping, relearning, they'll be revamping their processes, employees will be gaining new skills, and very few people practice mastery on the very first attempt. So there will be a learning curve in terms of moving into this new beginning. And I think employees should look to their leaders, um, and they will, to provide vision and guidance and support through the new beginnings. Um, there will be a period of disillusionment as people move to new beginnings and they discover that uh, the old learnings and the old ways of doing things in which they may have taken comfort in the past may no longer serve them well. And there may be some disillusionment, people may become de-energized. So there's going to be a role of a leader, not just in providing the vision, but this whole notion of guidance and support is critical. I call it reduce the depth of the dip meaning as people become disillusioned and they realize, oh wow, this is gonna be harder than I thought it was gonna be, that the leaders need to provide that support to get people to whatever the new realities are. So this is a, in my opinion, an absolutely perfect time to take a deep breath, to ask some of those bigger questions, and to begin that process of guiding people to the new beginnings, the new realities. And now I think we're going to move to questions and answers. Okay, if anyone has any questions, put them in the chat box. 
All right, Nancy, I have a question for you. Okay. How do I respond to so many different reactions among my team members? Some seem so withdrawn and lost, while others are hyper and even hostile. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. It, this is a, a period of seeing the extremes in, home, uh, in human reaction to these kinds of things. Uh, I know this is, sounds trite, but it first requires real patience, I think, on the parts of leaders, because we have a tendency sometimes to be uh, in our frustration, judgmental about how people are reacting. And uh, many times it's just a normal human response um, to, to what people are feeling. Um, and I think leaders need to have that patience, but they need to couple that with frequent and concise and very consistent communication. Here is where we're going. These are my expectations. And then holding people accountable for those. In other words, the fact that somehow people are fearful is not necessarily a, a real good excuse for letting so, someone off the hook for actually holding up their end of the bargain. It's knowing your people and it's communicating and then it's holding people accountable. Very good. Here's a good one for you. How do I deal with resistance to change? I have several staff members who believe that everything should stay the same as it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be comfortable, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, I think sometimes when we see fear of change, um, we have a tendency to talk it up to people being um, difficult or being snarly or mean-spirited. And, and when people are fearful, uh, I don't think they're necessarily trying to be difficult. And in this case, I think when people are fearful or resistant to change, it may be that they're fearful that they're not going to be able to do what needs to be done. There's going to be an incredible amount of learning, even unlearning. That, that goes on during this period. And learning and that capacity to learn is going to be absolutely necessary. So I think leaders need to convey to their teams that they have every confidence that people are gonna be able to figure this out, that people are gonna be able to learn what needs to be learned, uh, that you know we've gotten through um, change and, and uncertainty and certainty in white water previously. So um, we can do this and we can support each other in doing it. So be careful not to assume that people are being difficult and then try as much as possible to build their confidence. Okay, very good. And then you see the question online about suggestions of ways to communicate to this board of directors who are in denial of COVID. COVID. There are so many changes, there's impact financially, and there's impact with staff and expectations. I'm a, a um, big proponent of keeping things simple, keeping them frequent, and keeping them consistent. People are really overwhelmed with information right now, and so much of it is conflicting, that understanding, you know, what, what is the purpose of your communication, and then in bullet form, outlining the implications for, for whomever your audience is. In the case of a board, I saw that question uh, come by, I mean, really, you would make a, a list of bullets in terms of what are the implications for a board of directors as it relates to policy, as it relates to decision making, as it relates to fund development, as it relates to programming. And I would keep it very succinct. People do not respond right now to paragraph after paragraph of information. Keep it really concise. Good idea. And then Lori said that her management team recently sent a monkey survey to all employees to gauge their pulse on what they are feeling. What do they expect upon the return to the office? 
and she thinks that that would be very helpful. What, what are your thoughts? Yes, I've um, actually made a few recommendations to some of my clients that they do that sort of process of staying connected <laughs> with staff, um, either through a collective calendar, um, updates, <coughs> excuse me, um, I'm, I'm going to have to get a drink of water, I apologize. <coughs> Hold on one second. Sorry. Um, I would say frequent check ins. And one of the things I strongly recommend is touching base with each person individually on your team, doing something to get the team virtually together, maybe once a week to do a team check in. That was everybody. And what I would do is I would use one of those meta questions that we talked about earlier in each one of those team check-ins. In other words, rather than simply keeping those check-ins on the operational level and how is everything and what are your problems, keep the team focused on the potential and the possibilities ahead by including one of those big meta questions on each one of those weekly check-ins. Very good. Well, Nancy, thank you so much. This was most enlightening, and I know we all learned a lot. And as we go through this environment, we all need to stick together, share ideas, share best practices, and we will all get through this. So before we close, I would like to thank again today's sponsor, Fields Auto Group. And all of you, please visit the Chamber's website at www.sjcchamber.com. Follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter and Instagram for all the information and resources you need to assist you into this recovery. The Chamber has been doing a fantastic job communicating. Yeah, sure have. Today's discussion was recorded and the recording will be uploaded to the Chamber's website for playback. Thank you again to all our members and guests for your participation. It is very much appreciated. You have a wonderful weekend with our beautiful weather. God bless us all and thank you. <laughs>